of John chapter 5, we'll get started, um, get started there, we can kind of retrace a little bit from last week what we talked about, and we're going we're gonna to be in the, in, into chapter 5 uh, this week, but we're going to touch back on uh, a recorded passage of a miracle that Jesus performed in the end of uh, chapter 4, uh, verse 46. But tonight we want to talk about answering the question, what are you basing your faith on? What are you basing your faith on? Um, is it because of some spectacular experience that you have had? Um, you'd have to define that experience. You know, like for me, when I came to Christ, when people would talk about the 10,000 pounds being lifted and things like that, I know what that, I feel like I personally know what that means. I don't know that it was necessarily 10,000 pounds, but that's how the, the weight of life was for me. And when, when I gave my heart to Christ, that's how it felt for me. And I was in a, a pastor's office in premarital counseling of all places. And God had been working on my heart uh, for a season. I remember God speaking to me in a two-bedroom flat, and he just simply said, John, if you don't give your, your if you don't get your life right, you're gonna end up like your parents. And I don't mean disrespect to my parents, but my parents have been married and divorced multiple, multiple times. And God speaking to me, an unchurched kid, um, young man. Um, in a way like that was, was very surreal. And I had a conversation with my fiance that we were, and, and I just said what I felt God had spoke to me and, and it caused a little bit of a fight because of some things that were going on in our life. And God spoke to me probably in a very inconvenient moment uh, in our life for all the plans that you know a, a young couple like that may have when it comes to the world's standards. But uh, the experience that I had with Jesus, October the 28th, 1998, at 10.30 in the morning, was, was a life-changing experience. Um, and so I, I base my faith on the moment that I met Jesus, and he changed everything uh, for me. And, and you may have a similar story like that. That's kind of your testimony. It's not kind of. It is your testimony when you came to Christ. Some people will say, I came to Christ kind of like I remember that date. And there's nothing significant in a sense of, uh, some people say, well, I can't remember the date and the time like when you quote that. I, I don't think you have to have the date and the time memorized a specific, but there should be a season of your life where you remember dedicating everything to Christ and God moving in your heart. I think it's important to have that. I think it's, it's, it's really something you can point back to, especially when you begin to share your testimony. I know people that grew up in church that was later in their life where they really had an experience with God because you have first, second, first generation uh, Christians, second generation, third generation, even fourth and, and down to fifth. And the, and the first generation Christians, you know, based, they, they have an experience. They experience and encounter God. The second generation normally hangs on to the, the, the coattail or the pants leg of the first generation. And by the third generation, they pretty much lose the respect of the reason why. And you can be second, third, fourth, or fifth generation uh, believer in a family as long as you have a first generation experience, does that make sense? Like you just need to, there's like my kids are, would be second generation, but they can have a first generation experience. But if they think they're getting to heaven just because mom and daddy are in the ministry, then they're mistaken, right? They're kids. I want, I want, I want the third generation of our family to, to make it to heaven, not because my kids are serving in ministry or anything like that, but simply because, or because their parents would be serving in ministry, or the Lord, they felt like the Lord's called them to do, um, but because they had a first generation experience. But so many people base their relationship with God off of a, a lot of different things. Like, could people base it on an ability to keep a list of do's and don'ts? Could it be the, the rules that they keep, that they base their relationship? off of with Jesus like if they can do good enough then Jesus will love them and if they don't do good enough then God's going to punish them and I think there are standards and things like that but people have different views on how they how they approach this or is it because God's word is spoken to you there are some people that when they open up the word of God and they begin to read it looking for answers and they get into the gospels and it just wrecks their life you know and it's just the word jumps off the pages to them and, it, and it's life changing uh, for them uh, we did missions trips for several years. Uh, we did it to places like uh, Peru and Port Lima, uh, to Calau, which is a port city of Lima, Peru. Uh, we did Honduras, the Bay Islands, which you could have seen us raising funds for that. <laughs> People were like, you're going where? Like to the Bay Islands? Like, oh, I bet you are. Or you're going to be snorkeling for the Lord or whatever on that reef. 
And it's like, no, it's not really that. It's, it's uh, around all those resorts, if you ever go to these areas, they're very poverty-stricken and very uh, disadvantaged. And so tourism really blesses just those very few spots, but it doesn't seem to flow outside the walls uh, very well. And so we were in Honduras, the Bay Islands of Honduras, and, and, and Port uh, Calau, Port City of Lima. But we would go and do these um, Book of Hope trips, and we would partner with them. We would go and do uh, school presentations, and we would give them the Gospel of John. And even in these schools, there were some standards that they had. They said, hey, we don't want, to, uh, we don't want you talking about the name of Jesus. We're like, all right. So we would talk about, hey, the man in this book. So we would preach the Gospel in the presentations of what we did, much like you have to do in America when you go into the school system. And we say, and you're going to want to turn to page 34 in this book. You're going to read this. And what it was was the Gospel of John. And the really cool thing about it is these kids would start reading it immediately. And it's different in the States. You go to school assembly here in the States, they throw it in the trash, leave it on the bleachers. There, every one of them were reading it, and they were carrying it outside the, the, the walls of the school. And we would be loading the buses, and there would be 1,500, 2,500 students that we presented to that we did these dramas, did these skits for, talked about the things inside this Gospel of John message called the Book of Hope. And we would, and because it was a gift from Americans, they really valued it. But the parents would take it from them when they came out, and you would see parents sitting on the edges uh, of the mountainside reading the Gospel of John. But the thing about it is, is the one thing that is promised to us to go out and not return void is the Word of God. And so it was so powerful to see all of these people, these unreached people groups, reading the Gospel of John, not knowing they were reading the Word of God, and the truth of God is going to change their life. And so a massive revival breaks out, you know, in opportunities like that because the Word is infiltrating their society, and it can change people's lives. So what is the basis? Like, how would you base your faith? What is the, what is the, the thing you base your faith upon? We're going to look at several things, signs and stuff like that, that are recorded in the Gospel of John chapter 4 and John chapter 5. But before we do that, we're, we're going to review a little bit of where we were last week. So last week we covered Jesus was traveling to Galilee, but on his way to Galilee he had to go where? Through Samaria. And the reason he had to go through Samaria was to reach a Samaritan woman who was at the well. And because he offered her living water, she becomes a witness to her entire town. And as a result, many Samaritans believed in Jesus as the Messiah. And church history would teach us that her family members came to Christ. And they were so devoted to the, to the gospel of Jesus Christ that they were martyred for their faith. It's a pretty powerful moment. You know, I mean, a lot of people will claim a relationship with Jesus, but it's really a different level when you will lay your life down for the cause of the gospel. And then you see that moment happen, and you get to, to verse 46, and we can begin to read together. It says, Therefore he came again to Cana of Galilee, where he made the water into wine. And there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he had heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So this man that approached him that had heard that Jesus had come to the area was a royal official. The Greek word royal official implies that there was royalty. So it could have simply been a member of Herod's family or served in Herod's court, but he could have been also uh, a Jew or serving in a high office, like as, as to say as a Sadducee. But if he wasn't a Jewish man, then he probably wasn't religious at all. But still the word had gotten to him about Jesus, and he's desperate for his son. His son is sick, and he's heard about the miracles of Jesus, and he's willing to travel a long distance to see him. Now, he didn't jump in his car and drive 20 miles. If uh, It's not like the eastern shore, right? 7.5 miles past that's a mission trip, right, for people on the eastern shore. It's like, hey, you want to go to, you want to ride up to, to Bass Pro? Like, oh, man, so far. Like, if it gets past Chick-fil-A, I can't do it. It's, it's like, we gotta, you know, we got we to book that on the calendar. We got to raise funds. We got to, it's, it's people don't, most people that move here that, are, that transfer to the area, like us, when April and I came, we were used to having to drive 25 minutes to basically get anywhere. And so people that would move here from Birmingham would say, hey, we have to drive 50 minutes to get to gas stations. So it was traffic the, the right, you know, the, the, the wrong way. 
Uh, and then if you move from a metropolitan area, you 100% know what it's like to have to travel long distances. But he wasn't even able to jump in his car, even if it got stuck in a moment to have AC or anything like that. It's 20 miles that was either traveled by buggy or traveled by, by foot. So he's willing to travel 20 miles, walk 20 miles, up to 20 miles to see Jesus. He travels there, and his status, his dignity were not important at this point because he's a father begging Jesus to heal his son. And so when we come to Jesus, we're all beggars, right? We all come at that level, level ground, all beggars needing Jesus to intervene. I can tell you that I can identify with this man to, to a very large degree, because I, and I believe all of us can, because we're willing to take desperate measures when it hits close to home. I, I have a friend who, whose dad was a great example in our community, but they were cessationist. They believed that the, that the gifts of the Spirit, things like that, had ceased, um, and w- which I got to tell you, in a lot of ways, that's hopeless Christianity. To think that the supernatural of the devil is still in operation, but the supernatural of God is not. It's very dangerous to, it's very, it's kind of like, oh, I believe the demonic is active, but oh, anything that makes me uncomfortable for the Lord, I don't want anything to do with that. It's, 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 it's kind of dangerous. So, uh, but these individuals were, they had been trained and taught in their upbringing that it was over and it was of the devil, that, that there was no need for it anymore. Well, he got Lou Gehrig's disease, and I was friends with their oldest son and their youngest son too. But me and his oldest son played baseball together, and and he had gone through his his wild days. But he had he was also a musician, a very uh, seasoned musician, and had a band that had done really well in secular circles. and And God spoke to him one night while he was performing it was a New Year's Eve concert, and God spoke to him and said, "This I've created you for more than this." And he goes from making $1,500 personally a gig, and they're playing three to four gigs a week, just him alone. The rest of the band's making $1,000 a piece per gig. So they're making great money playing music at night in the clubs. And he goes and starts a Christian band where he might get a $300 offering when they go up with all of their speakers set up, their own soundboard, their crew, their sound, the light stage, the whole thing. Well, their dad gets Lou Gehrig's, and, and, and their dad really is a prince. It was a prince of a man. But it was crazy to me that whenever their dad got sick, the very things that they used to bash, now they were willing to drive long miles to arenas, to healing, faith healing evangelists, people like that. And I always say, you can make fun of it till it hits your house. And when it hits your house, you're willing to be desperate. And I'm telling you, I also believe that there's nothing significant in a man or a woman that that the gift resides specifically on them because the power of the Holy Spirit will move upon any flesh that is surrendered to Him. And nobody operates fully in that one gift. So, uh, Because if that were the truth and they operated fully in the gift of healing, they'd walk through the hospitals and heal everybody. But God can sovereignly move in a moment through faith and they be healed. And they went to, they went to arenas to, to be prayed for because if God did not heal him, he was going to pass away. Well, ultimately, he got to enjoy the last season of his life watching his kids live out destiny. And I think there are sometimes there are things that are a little more powerful than just physical healing. Because what if God had healed him, but his kids didn't come to a stronger faith through that season? It was a, it was a really cool moment. But I, I thought of them when I was reading through this of how... When, when sickness hit their house, they're willing to go to great measures, right? Willing to, to do that. For, for possibly some of you in this room or watching online, it may be that you've never publicly responded to an altar call when it comes to a prayer of faith being prayed over you. And, you, and, and maybe you're struggling in sickness or you're struggling through something or going through something. And we, we have an opportunity. You're like, man, I don't, I don't want to. I can tell you that, that God honors faith. God honors faith when you're willing to step out and do something different. And this man said he may have been royalty. At the very least, he could have been, um, you know, a Sadducee or or, or on the in that kind of realm. But the other was is if he wasn't, then he wasn't religious at all. So this is, it means that either this man who would be re- rejected because of his professing of an opportunity in Jesus, or this man who wasn't religious at all, was saying, you know what, I'm willing to try this if it'll make a difference for my son. So he travels there, didn't care about his dignity. They were not important to him at this point. And Jesus says to him in verse 48, he says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. 
And by the term when he says you people, it implies that a man was with a group. So he wasn't alone. He'd carried someone. He had people with him. And so Jesus' answer to him probably seems a little bit harsh, but he knew what was in the heart of the man. He knew that there were people who were only interested in seeing a spectacular event happen here. Jesus knew that a person could witness a sign and still not come to the knowledge of faith. Is it possible for someone to be healed by Jesus and not come to the faith in Christ? 100%. You got the story of the lepers, right? Only one returned with a grateful heart. I've told this story many times since I pastored here. I say many times, but I've been here 10 years, so I've probably told it four or five times, uh, which is not even a yearly average, by the way. Uh, one, of the, one of the first miracles that I was ever able to witness God perform personally in a physical uh, way was a kid that had had a, a really bad wreck and broke his uh, neck, and he was paralyzed from the neck down and had gotten an infection, and his and, and his parents were unchurched he was unchurched and the only reason they knew about me was because he was a, a 18 19 year old kid dating a 14 year old girl and that 14 year old girl was the niece of a youth leader of mine and she had come to church that week before and we prayed for them and, and she calls and says hey pastor johnny would you come pray with my boyfriend and and they don't think he's gonna make it well i was brand new in the ministry i'd itinerated but i hadn't done hospital calls really and uh, they didn't give a Bible college class on what to do with a dying 18, 19-year-old kid whose parents were unchurched. You know, because you can't go in there and be like, hey, it's good to see you. Oh, you seen them cowboys play? There's nothing really kind of ice-breaking that you can do. I walk into the room that seems a absolutely hopeless. He has spiked a fever. He's developed an infection. And if God doesn't intervene, there's nothing they can do for their boy. And I'm like, oh, that sounds great. It's a lot of pressure. And I'm going in, but it wasn't pressure on me. Because it's up to the Lord or whether he's going to move in this situation or not. I lay hands. I love to tell you that I laid hands on, and I was like, right now, I, was, I had faith walking in here and, I, and get a little hunt on my voice and all that, but I didn't at all. I laid hands and prayed like a scared kid. <laughs> you know, like the first time they asked you to bless the food in public. Yeah. It was, it was more like, Lord, you can do anything, but I, I, I pray more than healing him. You save his soul. That he, and all he could do was move his eyeballs at me. He couldn't move his lips, anything. Bad off sick. His eyes were, uh, had blood around his, his uh, pupils and stuff around the, uh, his eyes. I mean, he was in bad shape. I pray. I love on the parents. I, I hug the girlfriend. I leave, and then I get the phone call of 100% turnaround. The fever broke. He began to move his body, and he was the next day sitting up, ready to check out the hospital. And the doctor's like, this is a miracle. Pastor Johnny, we come into your church. We are coming to your church. We will be there. We'll... Do you know how many services they made? Zero. Zero services. <laughs> Zero services, but I can tell you this. That kid will never forget the moment where he had no hope. But Jesus stepped in. But even signs aren't enough for people to follow Jesus. It built my faith. And I have prayed for people to be healed and they've been healed. I've prayed for people to be healed and felt the presence of God and they were dead in 10 minutes. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I really thought that was going to work out different. I've been in some of the most awkward hospital call rooms. I was at a pretty big church before I came here, and so I was going to hospital calls and filling in. And the time that our pastor had transitioned and the new pastor was there, he went on a trip. He said, I need you to make all the hospital calls while I'm at, the really important ones, which means usually a, a death situation. I got a call and says, hey, Pastor Johnny, I know you don't know us. We got your number from the, from the admin assistant, and um, our mom's fist in the word to take her off the ventilator. We need you to come up here. And I go up there, and I've never met these people, and they're super gracious. And they said, you know, we got our mom's Bible. We want you to read the 23rd Psalm over her. And I'm like, absolutely. And I open up, and I start reading with some power, y'all. Problem was, it wasn't the 23rd Psalm. <laughs> now, what kind of preacher doesn't know what the 23rd Psalm says? I was so nervous, I was going say the wrong thing. I read the wrong Psalm. I was in Psalms 21. And I started, and I was reading it powerfully, and they were like, and everybody's kind of looking around, and I kind of catch them. I was like, I'm sorry, y'all. Psalms 23. Well, it was a good, laughable moment, you know. In the, so I've done stupid, and, and, and God's used it, and, and I've done what I thought was going to be a powerful moment. And the thing of it is, that's why we don't base what God does off of our feelings. 
Right? We don't base what God does off our feelings. So, so when he says this answer to him, he's saying, you know, just because he moves in his son's life isn't going to make this guy a follower of Jesus because there's still a decision he has to make. John 2, 24 says this. He says, but Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men, and he had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. God knows the heart of a person, even in the middle of what they're asking him to do. And Jesus would lament for over the seeing is believing philosophy of the Galileans. They were more like, they, they were kind of like they were from Missouri, the show me state. You got to show me, you know, type thing. And Jesus is saying, if you won't love me just because I'm God, then really no sign I perform is going to be necessarily enough because what you will do is want me to be a divine Santa Claus, a penny piece of bubblegum machine that just shows up and performs for you when you need me. And the children of Israel had plenty of that history. And so the key point here that we're going to look at first <coughs> is that there are people who will chase meetings where something spectacular is happening but won't sit through a doctrinal Bible study. Now, it, so, for example, when it comes to worship events, worship uh, moments, or, or like the blowout worship services. So, I always was alarmed as a worship pastor when we would have one of those breakout services and worship would go on for an hour and a half. And when the preaching would start, people would fall asleep. And look, the preacher wasn't that bad. <laughs> he wasn't, it wasn't like he was even like a metronome up there. Because I'm like, how in the world can you be so passionate and loving Jesus that you don't have respect for his word that's being preached? And so because there's a lot of emotion involved in worship, you know, but when it comes to the word, there are so many. And what has happened is, is, is in our society, so many people can tell you how the experience feels, but they can't point to in the word where it's found. And anytime their experience is challenged, they have no foundation to stand on to say why they believe what they believe. And so our faith doesn't grow or become mature by chasing events or an emotional experience. Now, I will say this. There's nothing wrong with attending an event or an outpouring, per se. But if you think that that is the only place God lives, then we can miss it. If, if there are people that even today will meet week after week chasing an old moment, from years ago, not thinking that God is with them or moving sovereignly in the moment they are in because it's not happening the way it used to. I mean, could you imagine how the New Testament church, the 120 in the upper room, if they had said, no, 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 we're not going to the marketplace. We're not going to go out and, and, and preach the gospel of Jesus. We're going to go back to this room and stay there and just wait for God to show up the same way every time. I mean... If that's the only place the outpouring of the Holy Spirit could happen, then why in the world is that not where we all are? Because in human terms, we want to put God in a box. We want to say, this is the way you can move, this is the exact way you're going to move, and this is the only way you're going to move. But God is sovereign. He can do whatever He wants to, whenever He wants to. And so I'm saying, God, whatever work you want to do in the season and the moment that we're in, then we want to surrender to that. I'm not going to try to, to manipulate something from my past. Because you may be doing a new thing. You may be doing a new thing in our hearts and lives. And I think, truthfully, when it comes to charismatic circles, they can use some depth in the Word. Because they're chasing feelings. They, they will go have church, do it again, wear themselves out, take a nap, come back, do it again, live like hell all week, just to come back and do it again on Sunday. And I'm saying, hey, the people that are dying and going to hell that you work with, need an opportunity to see that the power that you experienced in the service, see, the enemy would love to institutionalize a move of God in your life and then make it about a feeling that you have. And I'm not against feelings. I would be an absolute hypocrite to say that I don't love being moved by emotion in the presence of God. I love that. But I don't make whether I feel it or not the standard of whether God's there or not. Uh, maybe you can identify with this. Um, that's why when, when we look at, at, at the measurables in church, and they say, well, what do you want in church? I want the presence of God. Do we want the presence of God? Absolutely. Here's the problem. You can't measure it. Because <laughs> I can feel the presence of God, and Daniel could be right there mad about something Jenna said to him coming in and not feel it at all. 
Right? I have been in church services where somebody did something that upset me, and people are just in it, and I, I don't even think God's in the house. Though I know He is, because His Word says what? Where two or three are gathered, I'm there. So the presence of God. Look, so what happens is, is people have this shallow approach, like unless I feel it, it's not real. No, no. So that's why we don't live our faith by our feelings. So... So there's nothing wrong with, with attending an event. So like the uh, outpouring in, um, in Kentucky, the, the almost this Asbury revival that happened. Was there anything wrong with people going and checking out this revival and going there and experiencing that? No, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with going to that. It doesn't make them, you know, a bad person or anything like that. But if they come back and say, the only place God can move is that this revival in Asbury, then it's like, we need to just cancel church for the next three weeks and rent a charter company and go there. Because that's, but when people have an emotional encounter or, or a really big experience, they can get locked into, this is the only way God can. So where does the spiritual growth or the solidification really take place? Is through the word of God. Like when I had my encounter with Jesus as a 19-year-old young man, the Word validated everything that I experienced. So what happens in verse 49 is the royal official says to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus says, Go, your son lives. And the man believed the Word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. The man simply believed the Word that Jesus spoke. A lot of times when I pray, I just say, Jesus, all you have to do is speak the Word, and it has to be. The second key point is this is do we believe it's so as to act on what God's Word says by living it out? So what is our relationship to the Word of God? So in verse 51, it says, As he was now going down, his slaves met him, saying that his son was living. So he inquired of them the hour when he began to get better. Then they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. This again is a second sign that Jesus performed when he come out of Judea into Galilee. This is the second sign in this region. So in this instance, in this example that we see, his household comes to faith through this miracle. So people can come to faith through a miracle, but not everybody who's wanting to see a miracle happen and actually experiences or sees it will come to faith. Did all of the people that were with that man, the group of people, did they come to faith? If they did, it's not documented. But the part that is documented is that household. Like if you were to rewind to the story that I told you, and, and it, was your, it was your kid. Claude, if it was your kid, if it, if, if it, if it was... If it, was, if it was one of y'all's kids that had one of those wrecks and was paralyzed from the neck down, there was no hope given to him, and God showed up in a way, you would just want to think that that would change your whole life when it comes to, it comes to faith, right? If you were unchurched. Or let's say if, if, you were, if you were church hurt and had walked away from the church because preachers had done you dirty. But then you see the sovereignty of God and the love and the mercy of God just poured out in that moment and that mirror. It just seems like it would be natural to want. I, I don't know how they missed that moment. I don't know how that whole house doesn't come to Jesus. I, got, I don't get that. I can tell you that in my lost state as a, as a young kid, that if God had healed my uncle of lung cancer, I believe that it, that it possibly, that's what I want to believe. But the truth about it is, is even if they healed him of lung cancer, it may not have caused him to change anything in his lifestyle, may not have caused any of the decisions that they were going to make. Here's what I do know. God truly knows. And God doesn't base whether he's going to perform the miracle on whether or not they're going to follow him or not. So this man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. So in chapter 5, he goes back to Jerusalem because it's time for a feast. And chapter 5 says, after these things. So John has set in chronological order the life of Jesus, picking up the signs that we need to know in order to believe Jesus. Remember, because he's documenting not every sign, but he's documenting these signs and miracles so that we would come to faith in Christ and see how he operated in that season. So Jesus heals a man's son over distance. Could you imagine being, his, being the dad and you've got to travel 20 miles back, not knowing? He says, just go home. I wonder if he wasn't just a little bit let down that Jesus didn't even see it important enough <laughs> to travel back with him. He says, "Just your son's good, go. It 
See, people who are desperate for healing will flock to any site that offers a miracle cure. This is what chapter 5 offers is a controversy from a passage of Scripture. Uh, People who are desperate for healing will flock to anything that offers a a solution or or a miracle that they believe. Um, Several years ago, Jerry uh, has this story, he's given the story of where in, um, how do you say that town? It's a T-L-A-C-O-T. I, I'm not, he says it correct. See, I would have never said that. Say it one more time real loud and proud. Whatever that is. It's in Mexico. I do know that. 5,000 to 10,000 people a day stood in line for over a mile to get water from Chahin's well to cure their illness. Do you want to know why they stood there? Because when a sick farm dog recovers swiftly after drinking some water out of Chahin's well, he started giving it away. And once word got out, people traveled as far as from Europe and Russia. The health department tested the water, and there was nothing different about it. Not a thing. They found it to be normal. But Chahin said it weighed less than normal water. In fact, he attributed it to have healing properties, and it had supposed uh, attributes like it could cure AIDS, blindness, lameness, cancer, high cholesterol, and a number of other diseases. The following year, there was a spring a healing of healing water that was discovered in a cave in Germany, east of Dusseldorf. And people claimed it healed blindness, bad backs, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, high blood pressure. Now, if there were water that really did that for every single person, if you had any of these ailments, would you go? Oh, I would. I, I mean, I don't think it's... if. Because I wouldn't say, oh, this is evil, this is wrong, or this. I would go, hey, God gave us an opportunity to have. But if it's not real, then it gets manipulated, and it gets marketed, and it gets, it gets dangerous. And people make it about the well, or they make it about the water, instead of the one who owns the well and the water. So in John chapter 5, verse 1, it says, After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. Verse 4, For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water, and whoever then first, after the stirring of the water, stepped in and was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. So the text that you'll see in there is actually doesn't appear in earlier manuscripts, but it does in later manuscripts. And what this passage is teaching us is the, the simple geography lesson that we need to know, that there's two large pools by the Sheep Gate. They're surrounded by porches, and archaeologists have found what they think is the pool of Bethesda. And Bethesda means house of grace. And so the angel of the Lord who periodically stirred the waters, you got to understand, was this true? Did this happen? Did an angel of the Lord come and stir the waters? Or was it a blend of Hebrew religion and Greek superstition? Because what they end up finding out is it's commonly believed today there's an underground spring that periodically feeds the pools that causes a stirring. So the pool of Bethesda had become a sort of shrine. And the pool periodically rippled because of a subterranean spring. So long before what had happened was a a person who had been in the pool when it rippled had concluded that he was healed by the water. And news of the miracle spread over the city and surrounding countryside and a legend was born. And at certain seasons, an angel of the Lord went down into the pool and stirred up the water. And the first person to go into the pool after the stirring would be healed. Five porticos were built there so the six would be shaded from the sun as they waited for the stirring of the waters. This is why people would go there, the sick. And Graham Lott says that every reject in the city must have gathered in the pool of Bethesda, the house of mercy, with their emaciated bodies, their pale faces, their pain-deadened eyes, the hollow cheeks of all graves, silent witness to the helplessness and hopelessness of a diseased and disfigured and dying who lay crumpled and sprawled like discarded, refused on the terrace that led to the water's edge. Why? Because they were desperate. They were desperate for anything to touch their sickness. And it says in verse 5 that a man was there who had been ill for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you wish to get well? And the sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when when the water is stirred up. 
But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. And immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. So what begins the controversy for the Jewish people is the fact that Jesus did this on the Sabbath. But you got to remember what's happened. What's the miracle that's happened? 38 years the man's sick. 38 years he's needing healing. Jesus just speaks the word, tells him to pick up his pallet and walk. This is not the first time where you you hear Jesus tell a sick person to pick up their mat or pick up their pallet and walk. You back up and you see, or, or you see another spot in the Gospel of John's where friends carried their friend to the house where Jesus was and lowered through the roof. And he told that man, pick up your mat, your heel, to go and, and leave. So this man, he tells him that. And it says, now it was the Sabbath on that day in verse 10. So the Jews were saying that the man was cured. It's the Sabbath and is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, he who made me well was the one who said to me, pick up your pallet and walk. And they asked him, who is the man who said this to you? Pick up your pallet and walk. But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. And afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin any more, so that nothing worse happens to you. This has been interpreted. When Jesus says this, there are people who have interpreted from this comment, Do not sin any more, nothing happens to you, would imply that the man's sickness was due to his sin. He was healed physically, but he was challenged to stop sinning so that nothing worse would happen to him. Now, in general, sickness is a part of life in a broken and fallen world. I used to sit uh, in between classes, uh, and I would watch uh, free TV, and and there would be a lot of televangelists and things like that on uh, talk shows and whatnot. And I was listening to a TV preacher one day, and, and I hadn't been sick in a little while. And he said, if you'd hate sickness like the sin in your life, you'd never get sick. And I was like, I like that. That's really cool. April came home, and she had a little bit of a cough. And I said, hey, if you'd hate the sickness in your body like the sin in your life, you'd never be sick. I said it like he said it with a little bit of uh. There was no organ or a hanky to spank me when I told my wife that. But I had a wife who's very balanced and said, really? Then why don't you tell my, my cousin Victoria That's what she should do with her leukemia. That's the reason she's sick, because she didn't hate it, like the sin. I was like, yeah, you're right. My bad. But we know that all sickness is not due to a person's personal sin, because later in chapter 9, Jesus states to the contrary, that a man's blindness was not due to his sin or his parents' sin, but in order that God would be glorified. So there's no indication here that this man was ever saved. God can heal and does heal, but not all people who are healed are saved. And not all people who are healed have believed. Verse 15 does tell us that the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well, which also gave them an opportunity to hate him even more to pursue their case of crucifixion. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. They are furious because Jesus broke this rule and he answered them and said my father is working until now and I myself am working which is a definite no-no to the Pharisees to talk like that see it was against the rules to do any kind of work on the Sabbath and Jesus lets them know that God's still working even on the Sabbath and God is still in the healing business even on the Sabbath but where does the Sabbath come from and what does it mean So according to Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, the Hebrew people were to cease all work because the Creator rested after the seventh day of creation. On the sixth, He created. On the seventh, He rested. So this was intended to commemorate the Lord's creation of the world and celebrate His provision and to cease work because creation was complete. And Sabbath is based on the Hebrew verb to cease, which He never, however, stopped providing and protecting them. So Jesus heals the man on the Sabbath, Why are they mad about this? Because there are some things written in the mitzvot that there were Jews on interpretation of the law, and they added traditions. They added 39 classes of prohibited work on the Sabbath. To the simple command rest, the Pharisees added a long list of prohibitions like this, that you could borrow oil or wine on the Sabbath, but you could not say, would you lend me, because that would be a transaction. You could look for a flea on a Sabbath, You could read by lamplight. You might forget and get it to burn brighter. 
you couldn't push a button. They still have some of these rules. These were traditions of men. A woman couldn't dress her hair on the Sabbath because it would be considered building. If you had a toothache, you could not put vinegar on the tooth for healing because you cannot heal on the Sabbath. You can't carry your couch on the Sabbath. But here you have a man healed on the Sabbath and carrying his pallet on the Sabbath. Which brings us to the last point. That these classic legalists of Jesus' day were the Pharisees who were a group of experts in religion. When Jesus cleansed the temple, he claimed ownership of Judaism's most visible symbol. When he returns to Jerusalem, he claimed ownership of Judaism's most treasured institution, which was the Sabbath. And his purpose on that occasion was to restore grace. So let's answer the question, what is legalism? Legalism is the establishment of standards carefully selected by people for the purpose of celebrating human achievement under the disguise of pleasing God. It is righteousness as defined by human beings' standards. Now, you have to be careful and, and really understand what that means. So legalism. Legalism would be uh, some, some ways that, that we see common uh, legalism or ways that I have seen it. That a woman must only wear a blue jean skirt down to her ankles and can, cannot wear open-toed shoes because that showing of skin can cause a, a man to stumble. They cannot wear any sleeve, less, much less like sleeveless up to here. I'm talking about like, you know, them, them old like, you know, devil shirts down to here. Because if someone was to see that elbow, it's over. If there's a, uh, it would be, uh, you only go swimming in t-shirts and pants. Everybody. Because God can never be pleased with anyone who just wore a bathing suit. What happens is it becomes a style over content. The only music, here's one that's crazy that I heard. The only music in heaven is Southern gospel. Now, I can tell you, I like Southern gospel. I can sing Southern gospel. Noah found grace in the eyes. I love that. It's a fun song. Most of you, any of you listen to Southern Gospel on a regular basis? All right. Yeah, Gigi, I see that hand. Clint, I see you, man. There's a couple of us weird people in here. I get it. Three of us that, that was brave enough to raise your hand. Um, Chris, I always kind of took you as a Southern Gospel guy. <laughs> you didn't even know what that was. There was... <laughs> there was a... Um, well, the reason I know a lot of Southern Gospel is because of that free TV. They played the cathedrals a lot. <laughs> and, the, and the Gaither Gospel Hour was so good. If you ain't never heard of the Crab family, you're missing it. Jason Crab is singing like a house of fire. So, but for someone to say that, that that's the only music in heaven, where do you get that from? Just because it's his favorite style of music doesn't mean it's the only music in heaven. Right? They would say things like there's no such thing as Christian rap. There's no such thing as Christian rock and roll. But if you can say there's Christian country music like Southern Gospel, then you're really just hating on any other style than what you like. Another one was, if you had a TV in your house, then you were worshiping Satan. They said that the TV was the one-eyed devil with his tail in the wall. But somehow, even in that church, that that was their stance, now the Lord has changed his mind because now they have TVs. There would be this saying of, of all these different... You couldn't play cards because to play cards was worldly and sinful. I'm not talking about poker. I'm not talking about, you know, five-card draw. I'm talking about goldfish. Playing go fish. You, you go fish, you go to hell. Don't pass go. You don't get the four, the two, the jack, the king. You go straight and burn in hell. Why do you think people would say something like that? I can tell you why. Because somebody who had a gambling problem got delivered and they made all of it sinful. That's all. Legalism is dangerous. It takes style over content, personal preference over biblical proof. 
How does legalism appear? It always shows up in the righteous disguise of religion. I'll give you an example. I wanted to, I, I still want to please God as much as I can and live for Him as much as I can. I, but it's not a competition. I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to be better than Pastor Doug. I'm not trying to be better than Claude. I'm, I, I just want to live the life that God has for me. And I go to this singing at an apostolic church. And the thing about it is, is I can fit in in an apostolic church if I wear a long sleeve. I can shout, I can spit three rows back, and I can sing with them. I can take the mic, and we can like, oh, I wish somebody right now. I can do that. I can step up on the chair, walk the back of this all the way down this road without tipping it over if the Lord anoints it. Been a part of those, and I'm in this place listening to this guy named Billy Terrell sing, and he can sing. And I'm sitting there. Now, my wife doesn't come with me because she had her hair cut. And I ain't taking her there. That would have been dangerous. And I'm sitting there with a group of guys, listening to this guy sing, and he's giving an altar call. And this lady who's been eyeballing all service comes up and she says, I can tell you the day I got delivered and saved and set free in the Holy Ghost. And we're like, okay. She said, I was at this tent Brush Arbor meeting and I was hanging on to sin in my life and I looked down and it was that ring on my finger. I was like, oh, this woman has spent all service trying to find what's wrong with me and the only thing she could see was a ring on my finger because I looked like all of them except for that demonic wedding ring. It took me going to some stupidity like that to know I never wanted to be a part of something that dumb that this woman would be so confused to think that wearing her wedding ring would send you to hell. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life, and you will find no biblical proof of that. But this country woman is convinced that this is the gospel truth. She's convinced that if you don't get baptized in water in Jesus' name only, you're going to burn in hell. It ain't, the, it ain't the blood of Jesus that saves you. It's the blood and. And then if you don't speak in tongues, you ain't going to heaven. It was three things that had to happen. And can I tell you, when anybody adds anything to the blood of Jesus, to being saved, you need to run because it is heresy. It's legalism. Why is it wrong? Is water baptism a powerful thing? Absolutely. Is being baptized in the Holy Spirit a powerful thing? Absolutely. But when you make those two things the standard of the blood, sacrificial blood of Jesus, you have missed it completely. Why it's wrong is it denies God's grace and presumes to earn His favor through works. It's a man-made righteousness that exalts humanity rather than the Lord. We want to clean people up and not leave it up to the Holy Spirit. I worked in those churches. I heard so-and-so was doing this. You need to go get them. But I can tell you, I can make somebody mine, but I can't change a life. Only God can do that. I can make my kids mind me because they'll lose every privilege they think they have. I still pay for everything they do. That's why when parents are like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my kids, starve them. That's so mean. They will they'll give in and eat, I promise. Now, I know that may sound terrible to some of y'all, but let your kid run your house, then come talk to me. I don't know what, I can't take their phone from them. Well, if they're giving you an allowance, then maybe it'll work that way. And what happens is, is we want to clean people up and we're not the Holy Spirit. The reason it's wrong is it wants to make what your personal experience is the corporate experience that everyone needs to have. So if April and I said, hey, we need to take the TV out of our house because we just feel like we're watching things that aren't honoring the Lord and our kids are not, and we just need to spend more time talking to each other. And let's say we do that and this powerful thing happens and we start having great fellowship as a family. Do you think there's anything wrong with us saying, we don't have a TV in our house? But you know what would make it wrong? Is if I said, because I don't have a TV, you better get rid of the TV in your house. Now, we have TV in our houses, on the porch and everything. Hey, you know what? It's kind of like those people that get in shape and think everybody else is going to hell because they're not in shape like them too. I see you flexing, Emmanuel. It's... There's nothing wrong with personal legalism. There's something very wrong with corporate legalism. So 
It says in verse 16, for this reason the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. And he said, my father's working until now and to myself I'm working. Jesus' relationship with the father is a very intimate relationship. It's totally dependent upon his father. So this is the same relationship that we're supposed to have with him. So for the two reasons the Jews wanted to kill Jesus was because he healed on the Sabbath and he made himself out to be equal with God. But did he heal the man that was sick for 38 years? Absolutely. So when I ask the question, is our faith in God only because we witnessed a spectacular event or had an emotional experience? Is our faith based on our ability to keep a religious list of do's and don'ts like the Pharisees? I, was, I met someone this afternoon, spent a little over two hours with them, and I told them some things that are very big standards that, that I have personally. And I said, but I never talk about them because it's, I'm not trying to give a list of what I do and what I don't do. I'm trying to, t- but what I will talk about is my love for Jesus, and that's it. And I don't attach my love to Jesus by the things I do. I attach my love to Jesus because he intervened in my life, encountered my life, and changed my life. That's why I love Jesus. I don't, I'm not doing these things to love. I'm not staying faithful to my wife to try and prove something to someone. I'm not staying faithful to my wife to earn salvation. I couldn't earn it. I can't do anything to receive. But what I can do is because I am saved, I can be faithful to my wife not to be saved, but because I am saved. And we start talking about uh, these things, and I thought, man, this is... People are looking, sometimes they look for a list because lists are easier to do than intimacy with Jesus. Is our faith based on God's word like the royal official who believed Jesus' word? It's always crazy to me when I hear preachers preach on the armor of God and skip the last part of it. They talk about every piece of armor except praying in the Spirit on all occasions. It's the craziest thing. It's in there. And if it's in there, you don't skip it. (laughs) So what is our faith based upon? It's based on the ability of God's mercy and his grace that only God can redeem a person. And the things that we're doing, the standards, this is not like a sloppy grace teaching. When we get to John chapter 8, you'll see how that works. You never, you, when God sets someone free and delivers them, has an encounter with them, you don't see anything about this man, whether his background or whatever, that he just continues in the brokenness of what he was in. You don't know much about this man that was healed in the pool of Bethesda or at the pool of Bethesda when Jesus spoke to him. But the point of all of it is that these, these religious leaders are like, God can't do it that way. Now, God can do whatever he wants, however he wants. It would be like someone saying, well, you know, I just don't believe that. Because you get into church hating, right? People will, this church doesn't do it right. and This church doesn't do it right. You know what I learned as an itinerant evangelist? That every church thought they were the only ones doing it right. <laughs> and when you go in and they would ask you things. Does anybody remember the Brownsville revival back in the day? You had the Wake America Crusades. So when I'd go to preach in a church, they would say, have you been to Brownsville? Well, I didn't know what to say. Because if I said no, some people are like, well, you can't come here because you ain't got the anointing unless you've been to Brownsville. So if you, it was like you were wrecked if you said no or you are wrecked if you said yes. You didn't know. But I wasn't going to lie. No, I hadn't been. Why? Because I ain't got gas money. I ain't against the Brownsville revival. There's some crazy stuff that's happened there. I knew some people that had some very genuine experiences there. It's kind of like the Ontario revival in Canada. The story of the, the whole the animal noises they were making in the altar. Well, if you knew why that happened, there was a little girl that had answered the altar, gave her heart to Jesus, and the speaker said, the first noise that comes to you, the first thing that comes to your, your mind that resembles peace, I want you to shout it. She started crowing like a rooster. Well, then everybody else around her started crowing like a rooster. They thought it was a manifestation of the Spirit, and it wasn't. Her rooster crow was genuine. Everybody else's was fake. You want to know why she crowed like a rooster? Because at 5 every morning, the rooster crowed, and the man that was in her bedroom raping her all night, when the rooster crowed, he got up to go to work. So for her, that's what that rooster crow. So I'm not critical of somebody else's rooster crow because I don't know why they crow. But I can tell you this. What God doesn't want you to do is make a show of it. Like when someone comes and says, hey, hey, you know what I think we need? 
We need flags and tambourines. I'm like, I've heard you clap. I don't think a tambourine's a good idea. <laughs> I'm not against things, but the thing, what I'm against is anybody making their thing a spectacle and taking attention away from the glory of God. I would do the same thing with a singer who makes it all about them. We're not do, there is no so, such thing as a rock star for Jesus on this platform. We're like, oh, they're so great. Oh, they're our artist in residence. Oh, we should get their autograph after service. Mm-mm. We just want the presence of God. That's it. What is our faith based upon? What is it based upon? I will tell you, as far as celebration, there are a lot of things that are movements. People are, they'll chase movements. And I can tell you what we are. We're the local church. We don't get in the ditches. We stay in the road. And we go after Jesus, and everything that we do is in this book. And if it ain't in there, I ain't interested in it. Why? Because I don't have time to chase movements. People are lost and broken and they need an encounter with Jesus. And after they encounter Jesus, they don't mind movements. But movements are confusing to people who have not encountered Jesus. And the thing I'm not interested in doing is trying to take a moment that I had 25 years ago and say, this is the only way, God. Could you imagine if I was making y'all sing the same songs every week that I experienced 24 years ago in church? I'm not saying we couldn't go to the enemy's camp. Take it on back. He's under my feet. Well, we can you know, look what the Lord has done. Oh, here goes the one leg spin. Here it comes. But if that's the only way God can move, what we've become is creatures of habits, that this is the only way that can happen. And I'm telling you that I love anthems like gratitude that we sing. I'm just a fan of the presence of God. I'm a fan of the Holy Spirit convicting people's lives because when God gets involved, oh, it's really powerful. But when man gets in the way, it can become a dangerous thing, Right? Let's pray. Father, I love you. Thank you for an opportunity, Lord, to get into your word. I'm so thankful for the truth of your word. I'm so thankful for the power of your word. And I'm so thankful that you gave us a guide and a standard and how we can live our life and how we can base our experiences and how our experiences can be validated by the word. God, I thank you. You're a big God. And that we're just little people. I thank you, Lord, that your word is inexhaustible. But, Lord, we're exhaustible people. Lord, I thank you that there's something good to eat every time we get in there. Lord, may we take what's been fed through your word, and may we eat on it. And may we be full of the Spirit because of it. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.